Oh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to our COVID-19 professional webinar. This is Stephanie Hall from the ESRDNCC, and I will be your host today. <clears throat> we can go to the next slide. So let's just talk about, before we get into our presentation, what the agenda is is going to be today. Well, first, uh, what is the call about? Uh, our today's speaker I'm very excited about. It's Dr. Tannenbaum. He is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Sanderlin Renal Services <clears throat> USA from Nashville, Tennessee. We're going to be talking about telemedicine and nephrology. Um, and during the presentation today, if you do have questions for Dr. Tannenbaum, we are going to have time at the end of the presentation for uh, Q&A. And now we would ask that you submit those questions into the chat. And we will um, get through as many as possible at the end of the presentation. So we want to hear from stakeholders and peers in the ESRD community who are adopting to COVID-19. Um, we're going to be sharing examples and provide real-world strategies for facilities to use, and we're going to engage in bi-monthly calls on varying topics. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. As I said, it's Dr. Uh, Jerome Tannenbaum. He's a nephrologist specialist in Nashville, Tennessee, and has over 44 years of experience in the medical field. He is board certified in internal medicine and nephrology and is a fellow of the American College of Physicians. In late 2008, Dr. Tannenbaum left DSI Renal in order to form Sanderling Healthcare LLC to commercialize his pre-engineered construction methodology for hospitals and other healthcare facilities. Currently, he is the founder Chairman and the CEO of Sanderling Renal Services, which he co-founded with Deborah Tannenbaum and Dr. Raji Prasad in late 2012. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over the call now to Dr. Tannenbaum. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yes, very Good. loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak today on, on uh, the use of telemedicine in nephrology. And if I can have the first slide. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the uh, chairman and CEO of Sandling Renal, which is a multi-state dialysis and telenephrology provider. Uh, and uh, as the slide indicates, I'm not receiving compensation related to this webinar. Next slide, please. So to begin with, telemedicine is not really new. Um, it was really used, uh, interactive video was used uh, to deliver medical support as early as the 1950s. And uh, in the 19, uh, late 1960s, early 70s, uh, we actually uh, were using video and physiologic monitoring of astronauts in space, no less. And that is uh, probably the epitome of telemedicine. Uh, it was then used uh, more uh, recently by the U.S. military in the late 1980s uh, to deliver medical care to frontline military personnel. Uh, Jack Moncrief, a nephrologist based in Texas, actually started uh, a, a very robust telemedicine program in Central Texas in the early 1990s, and that was funded uh, by AT&T. Uh, in those days, uh, the uh, hardware was very expensive, uh, and the uh, bandwidth was very limited. But despite those obstacles, uh, Dr. Moncrief was able to successfully perform over 13,000 telemedicine encounters, uh, most of them among his uh, dialysis patients who were in various rural communities in Central Texas. Uh, <clears throat> I personally was involved in uh, establishing a telemedicine program uh, for the prison system in the state of Texas. Uh, the prisons, there are 93 uh, prisons uh, in the state of Texas, and UTMB in Galveston uh, was responsible for delivering the medical care to uh, the inmates at those locations. And uh, we uh, basically implemented a, a full telemedicine program uh, involving a command center in Galveston and remote locations in each of the prisons. Uh, and we're uh, even in the late 1990s, we were providing over 90,000 encounters per year to 325,000 inmates. Next slide, please. So telemedicine has really advanced quite a bit since those early uh, pioneering days. Uh, in the early 2000s, or I guess the late uh, later part of uh, the first decade of 2000, 2008, 2009, uh, 
something called EICU became uh, available. And EICU is uh, uh, permitted tertiary care facilities to provide critical care medicine and nursing support to rural hospitals in their region. And uh, what you see here in the upper left is a, a command center nurse uh, looking at physiologic waveforms uh, being presented real time from remote rural hospitals. At the other end of the spectrum, you have today companies like Teladoc and Amwell uh, who are providing uh, uh, a much simpler form of telemedicine, uh, primarily using uh, an iPhone or Android device where patients uh, can get on the uh, audiovisual connection with a provider and receive medical advice in real time without having to go to a physical office. Next slide. So the question is, what is telemedicine? So the World Health Organization has a definition, which is a kind of a, a, a mouthful to read, but basically it's telemedicine is the delivery of healthcare services using information and communication strategies for the exchange of valid information for diagnosis and treatment of disease in order to advance the health of individuals in remote areas. CMS has a somewhat simpler definition, which basically is telehealth, telemedicine, and related terms generally refer to the exchange of medical information from one site to another through electronic communication to improve a patient's health. Other terminology that's important to understand when you're talking about telemedicine includes uh, the following. Asynchronous, this is otherwise called store and forward technology, is a situation where you capture an image uh, or data on the device and then transmit it uh, to uh, another location but the transmission is intermittent and it's not really in real time. Uh, so you could take the image, it might be a classic example of a dermatologist, might take uh, an image, uh, have someone take an image of a lesion uh, remotely and 20 or 30 minutes later, they uh, are sent a, a photograph uh, of that lesion. That would be store and forward technology. On the other hand, uh, synchronous bi-directional technology is what we all know today is real-time audio or audiovisual communication. And it's really this synchronous bi-directional technology that we think of when we talk about telemedicine. Also, uh, what I gave a minute ago were two examples. One was the EICU, the other was a uh, typical, uh, call it uh, Teladoc or similar company. Uh, the first is uh, B2B, that is the EICU concept. B2B means business to business. And in that case, the telemedicine is taking place not between necessarily the patient and the provider to the exclusion of others. It's really taking care of a patient remotely with the help of providers who are actually at the distant site. Um, and then the uh, B2C is what has now become popularized as telemedicine uh, available to the general consumer, where a consumer might feel they have a sore throat, they have a fever, they want to get uh, medical advice, they contact a telemedicine service uh, on their uh, iPhone or iPad and get uh, a telemedicine consult. That is B to, B to C. Next slide, please. COVID has really uh, broadly expanded the use of telemedicine for obvious reasons. Uh, the first and foremost is that we didn't want patients coming into uh, into the hospital or the office uh, when it could be avoided uh, because we didn't want to expose the patient to uh, infections that might be in those environments. And likewise, we didn't want to expose those infections, uh, the, the, those environments to patients who might be infected with COVID. And so telemedicine quickly became uh, a reality for many uh, patients. And um, in addition, uh, the, uh, the result is that we have a, a broad utilization of telemedicine today. So historically, CMS only reimbursed, Medicare only reimbursed for telemedicine visits if they were performed uh, on patients who were in rural areas or living in medically underserved areas. Uh, this was known as the originating site. And in addition to being in a rural or medically underserved area, 
CMS required that the originating site be one of the qualified sites, meaning a hospital, a critical access hospital, a rural health clinic, a federally qualified health clinic, an Indian health service facility, a physician's office, as long as it's in a rural or medically underserved area, or a hospital-based ESRD facility. For those of you who are on the call today who are nephrologists, nurses, uh, dialysis nurses, and dialysis providers, it's notable that uh, CMS excluded the use of telemedicine, at least for reimbursement purposes, in rural dialysis facilities that were not owned by the hospital. In other words, a freestanding dialysis clinic could be on the campus of a rural hospital, but it did not qualify as an originating site. I have to confess that I'm not entirely sure uh, why that uh, anomaly uh, developed in the CMS regs, but Fortunately, that, uh, that uh, peculiar issue has now been lifted with the COVID uh, waivers. Uh, the other facet of the CMS requirement is that you had to use real-time, real synchronous, bi-directional audiovisual communication. In other words, uh, store and forward technology uh, did not count for reimbursement unless you happen to live in Alaska or Hawaii. The COVID waivers now allow reimbursement without any regard for geographic or originating site. Uh, they can be uh, performed in urban areas. You can perform telemedicine and get reimbursed uh, even if the patient is in an urban hospital, uh, an urban dialysis clinic, whether it's freestanding or owned by a hospital, or even the patient's home. In addition to the location being expanded, CMS has expanded uh, the use of telemedicine to uh, uh, 135 additional services, which are now reimbursed uh, under telemedicine. And this basically covers almost any service delivered by a licensed professional uh, that has a provider number or could have a provider number uh, with CMS. Uh, the technology uh, for reimbursement now has also been expanded to include phone conversations, even without a visual component. Uh, HIPAA has been relaxed. Um, the, one of the impediments to the uh, de deployment of, of electronic records and to um, uh, televideo conferencing and to uh, telemedicine is that you had to comply with uh, HIPAA privacy requirements. Uh, these have been significantly relaxed uh, under the COVID uh, crisis environment, under the COVID waivers. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, we, uh, yeah, Matt, if you can bring up the polling question. And the polling Please. question is open, uh, and the question is, if you should see it on your screen, asks, are you currently using telemedicine in your home program? Uh, click yes or click no, but whatever you click, be sure you click that submit button so we receive your answer. Thank you, it's on the, kind of on the right-hand side of your screen. And Stephanie, we'll leave this open for a little bit until the, the yep. responses start to slow down. We're already uh, already got almost 50 percent of our attendees have responded. Okay. Thank you for that. Perfect. If you can monitor that, we'll give everybody just another second, and I think um, we'll close it out now in three, two, and one. Matt, you can share that with us. I sure am. It's going to take about 15 seconds for WebEx to tally the results here, but uh, I will give you an advance uh, peek here. It looks like uh, about 75% of respondents say that they are, and we'll share the results of our poll here. Uh, just about two seconds. And here we, you should see them on your screen now. Great, yes, that's, a, that's quite a, a good over well, we number that are utilizing some some form of telemedicine right now. Um, very good. Well, thank you. We'll get back to the slides. And Dr. Tannenbaum. Great, thank you. So, as far as utilization goes, uh, Medicare, of course, has been tracking this based on reimbursement requests. And just to put in perspective, uh, virtual uh, visits have increased from 13,000 per week prior to COVID to 1.7 million encounters per week in the month of April. And what's interesting is that uh, roughly uh, 
a third of the patients, uh, a third of the telemedicine encounters uh, were audio only, thanks to the waiver of COVID, uh, the restrictions uh, waived by COVID. Uh, roughly a third were using a telemedicine platform uh, that is a proprietary platform, as I said, for example, uh, American Well, uh, InTouch, et cetera. And then um, finally, a third of the uh, telemedicine encounters were just done with commercially available off-the-shelf products like uh, FaceTime, uh, Skype, uh, Zoom, and so forth. In addition, what's also interesting is that the age range uh, with virtually all ages uh, um, of patients, uh, not just it's not just limited to uh, a younger population, which a lot of people assumed to begin with that uh, older people wouldn't know how to use the technology, but that turns out not to be the case. And there's no uh, potential propensity towards any particular ethnic group. So it's broadly, as, uh, telemedicine has been broadly adopted and widely used by virtually everyone. Next slide. I think the biggest question that some people have, most people have is, okay, what happens after COVID? Are we going to be able to use telemedicine, which is really proven to be very, very helpful uh, after COVID? And of course, let me qualify by saying, no one says that we can't use telemedicine. The question is whether we can get paid for it. And, you know, if you look at the comments from uh, Seema Verna, who is the administrator of CMS, I'm concerned that we may have some significant headwinds. And the first quote really, uh, in my view, uh, gives us a, a glimpse of what may be coming. Uh, Dr. Verma says, Verna says, telehealth will never replace the gold standard in-person care as an additional access point for patients providing convenient care from the doc, provided convenient care from their doctor and healthcare team and leveraging innovative technologies that could improve health outcomes and reduce overall healthcare spending. So to begin with, I think the CMS attitude might be that, um, okay, telemedicine is not quite as good as in person. Um, I personally would beg to differ because I've had experience, uh, obviously, uh, uh, extensively with both uh, modalities, and we'll discuss that uh, a little later in the talk. Uh, but it is the tone that is going around CMS. Uh, I think you also get a glimpse of what CMS is thinking because um, they're realizing that um, uh, in a true in-person setting, there are other costs of delivering the care. For example, in a physician's office or a hospital, you've got patient gowns, cleaning, disinfectants, uh, things that are built into the in-person uh, visit. Uh, at a facility, which those things are not uh, part of the cost of delivering a telemedicine visit. I think their positioning uh, to maybe give a different tier of reimbursement to telemedicine, whereas today uh, telemedicine is reimbursed at the same price uh, as an in-person visit. Uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, there are a lot of there's a lot of support on Capitol Hill for uh, pursuing uh, telemedicine even beyond COVID. And um, in fact, there is a letter recently signed by 35 senators uh, supporting the idea of extending telemedicine beyond COVID. And they've sent a letter to HHS uh, requesting more details on how CMS uh, uh, and HHS plan to, uh, to extend telemedicine beyond COVID. Next slide. Uh, just uh, for your information, uh, for those of you who live in states that these uh, senators uh, reside in and represent you, uh, take a look at their names because if you have an opportunity, I suggest you encourage them to pursue this further. Next slide. So why has telemedicine suddenly become feasible? We already understand that COVID has, has created the the, uh, not the opportunity, in a sense, the opportunity, but also the mandate for it. But what really has made it possible is that we now have uh, high speed cellular and Wi Fi networks almost throughout the country. Even in rural communities, it's usually pretty good. Uh, the other thing is that we have ubiquitous deployment of electronic medical records. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience when we started using telemedicine, but before electronic medical records were widely adopted, it was very, very difficult to do an adequate consult in a reasonable period of time. 
because getting the records faxed to you was a challenge. Uh, you were dealing with a paper chart. Now we have the ability, whether it's a hospital-based patient or an office-based patient, we can dial in remotely to the EMR, see what's going on with the patient historically, what other notes have been captured, lab data, and so forth. And really, the uh, so the availability of high-speed cellular network and Wi-Fi network and the availability of electronic medical records with remote access to those records has made telemedicine a reality. The other thing that's really helped is the availability of affordable uh, devices that can be used for remote monitoring. Uh, these would include, for example, an electronic stethoscope, which is web-enabled and allows the uh, physician to actually do full auscultation of the patient remotely, real-time, uh, with the assistance on the other end of someone's position the stethoscope. Uh, we can also use other remote monitoring tools, pulse oximeters, uh, EKG waveform devices that can transmit real-time electronic waveforms to us. And most dialysis, uh, newer dialysis equipment now is equipped with uh, automated flow sheet capture that can be transmitted electronically via Wi-Fi uh, or cellular to uh, a cloud and allow uh, the provider to look at the results of the flow sheet uh, remotely. Uh, and the same thing applies to even uh, commercially available things, whether it's, pulse, as I said, pulse oximeters, the Apple Watch, uh, Wi-Fi enabled scales, blood pressure devices, and so forth. Uh, last but not least is that the multi-channel meetings that are available on uh, things like Zoom, WebEx, and so forth, and other proprietary platforms now allow a full interdisciplinary team meeting to take place with a social worker, dietitian, nephrologist, nurse, and patient all in remote locations, simultaneously seeing and talking with each other. And last but not least, every one of these devices and technologies is now readily affordable. Next, next slide. So the applications of telenephrology in the outpatient in, 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 in nephrology are uh, in the outpatient side, uh, CKD clinic, uh, outpatient nephrology consultations, patient education, and that includes modality education. 75% of you are already using it for home, uh, home treatments, uh, home uh, visits. Uh, but um, I believe that long term, we're going to find that more and more of the CKD clinic visits, uh, consultations, modality education will take place via telemedicine. I don't think it's going to revert back to the office-based practice for the simple reason it's actually much more convenient for the patient, particularly patients who live far away in remote communities, and frankly, it can be much more convenient for the, uh, the medical staff as well. Uh, what people may not be aware of is that we are doing a lot of inpatient nephrology uh, with telemedicine. And that includes emergency room consultation, inpatient consultation, critical care, uh, routine consults, uh, emergency consults, stat consults, day and night consults, uh, and even oversight of acute dialysis on inpatients. Uh, in the outpatient clinic, uh, we are also using uh, telemedicine to uh, visit our patients while they're on treatment at the center. And as I said earlier, have interdisciplinary team meetings and QAPI meetings, all of which can be facilitated uh, by uh, telemedicine. And in the home dialysis situation, uh, again, uh, home dialysis monitoring, not only with flow sheet, but actually real-time monitoring of the patient when needed with televideo conferencing and remote auscultation with a stethoscope has become uh, a really invaluable uh, tool for us. Uh, we have a number of patients who are at home, and when they run into a problem, instead of simply talking to them on the phone, we actually now have the opportunity to examine the patient remotely and listen to the patient uh, with our remote stethoscope. And I know anecdotally, I've been able to uh, keep some patients from having to transfer uh, to an emergency room because it became obvious after doing a full telemedicine visit that they really didn't have an acute problem. Next slide. So from the inpatient point of view, uh, what we found is that uh, telemedicine has uh, tremendous utility, not only in rural communities, but even in urban markets. It's very helpful because it gives the uh, patient virtually almost near a 
near immediate availability of a nephrologist. I mean, even if you are in a, an urban market um, and you're making rounds at a hospital and you get a consult and the patient is in the emergency room, uh, you may have to drop what you're doing and go down to the emergency room or go to the critical care unit to visit the patient under normal circumstance. With telemedicine, you actually can take the consult from wherever you happen to be standing at the moment if it's a truly stat consult, and you can start initiating therapy, definitive treatment, a lot sooner. Uh, obviously, the nephrologist can also coordinate uh, with other consultants very readily through virtual meetings. Uh, Last, you know, and nephrologists can, many nephrologists today are uh, traveling from one hospital to another. Um, and uh, for many of you uh, who do this, you know that uh, you leave one hospital and no sooner do you get in your car going to another hospital, uh, your uh, cell phone goes off, you get a text message, and you really kind of wish you could see the patient. Well, now you can actually do that with telemedicine. Uh, so it, it can actually not only, again, expedite the care, but it can eliminate, completely eliminate the drive time between hospitals, clinics, and the office. Uh, it importantly eliminates the nephrologists and other caregivers, uh, nurse practitioners, and so forth, as a vector of infection. I mean, when you consider that we see patients in the hospital on every floor of the hospital, and many hospitals, not just one hospital, uh, no matter how careful we are, we are basically a vector of infection, uh, even more so than the staff at the hospital who are typically uh, operating on one, uh, one particular patient one at a time. Uh, furthermore, with telemedicine, it, it clearly reduces the exposure of the nephrologist and, and the nurse practitioners uh, to, uh, uh, to infections. So it, it is both protective to the patient and to the public health and to the caregiver. Um, in the outpatient clinic, uh, we've been able to, uh, again, just like at home, we've been able to readily evaluate the patients via telemedicine. Uh, as all of you know who are practicing uh, nurses and nephrologists in dialysis, uh, patients don't necessarily get sick on the same schedule as the nephrologist's rounding schedule. And in the use of, uh, uh, <laughs> and in the use of uh, telemedicine, uh, if the uh, charge nurse or the nurse manager is concerned about the well-being of the patient, they can actually get the tele nephrologist up on the screen, and we can do an interview uh, and give additional guidance to the staff at the clinic. Again, we have personally seen uh, a reduction in emergency room transfers as a result of this. And last but not least is it really eliminates uh, non-productive transit time that all of us are faced with in, in medicine today and gives us more time to interact with our patients on a direct basis. Next slide. So the prerequisites to make this really work, uh, regardless of where you are, you have to have remote access to an electronic medical record. Uh, you have to have real-time, uh, ideally you have to have real-time monitoring of dialysis. Uh, in our environment, we actually have secure instant alerts so that the EMR actually transmits to us real time uh, anytime the patient has a blood pressure, uh, hits a blood pressure limit, an ultrafiltration rate limit, and so forth. And this gives us, <clears throat> as nephrologists uh, uh, and nurse practitioners, even uh, some advance notice even before we get a call from the charge nurse. Uh, you have to have someone at the site to help you position the camera. Uh, it could be a family member uh, if it's in the home. It can be a staff member if it's at the hospital or in a clinic. Uh, ideally, you have an electronic stethoscope on the, uh, at the patient site. Again, with the help of someone positioning the scope, uh, you can get uh, very good auscultation, uh, accomplish very good auscultation with this device. Uh, in order for that to happen, though, you have to have a quiet room. Uh, and good ambient lighting, which is frankly no different than if you're sitting there in, per in, in, in person. Uh, and last but not least, you need to have uh, a good Wi-Fi connection. And we found that three megabits per second is very adequate, which in today's world is, is pretty common. Um, if it's a home patient, they have to have a reliable internet connection. Uh, some of our patients honestly don't, and we have to uh, uh, find them a way to get a good internet connection. Uh, the patient has to have an iPad or an iPhone if they're at home. Uh, again, uh, there are certain um, 
uh, restrictions uh, that CMS uh, on the self-referral and the fraud and abuse uh, have to be observed. But it is possible to give a patient an iPad or an iPhone at home as long as you restrict its use to uh, true bona fide telemedicine uh, care. Um, you have to have a good, accurate blood pressure cuff at home and a good scale and a household member who uh, can be taught to help you with the camera and uh, possibly even the electronic stethoscope. Next slide. Limitations uh, on exam. Really, the only limitation uh, is you really can't palpate the patient. I mean, we haven't, telemedicine hasn't figured that out yet. Um, so you have somewhat limited ability to perform an abdominal exam. But even there, believe it or not, we've learned how to uh, instruct the uh, on-site provider, whether it's a technician, a nurse, or a family member, to, uh, to palpate the abdomen in their presence. And we usually can see if the patient uh, grimaces or has wincing pain, we know that there's a real problem. If not, um, we are, you know, have somewhat limited uh, ability uh, for exam, uh, abdominal exam. Uh, we can't do chest per percussion of the chest, but we, or we, nor can we feel for the cardiac PMI. Uh, but again, with auscultation, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty good. And we'll go on to an even better method in a minute. And of course, we can't palpate the fistula or graph, but we can certainly listen to it uh, through the electronic stethoscope. Um, until recently, we couldn't perform urine uh, microscopy uh, remotely. Of course, we still can't in a home setting, but we've actually developed uh, urine microscopy remotely uh, for inpatient uh, consults, uh, where we have the uh, uh, take the urine specimen to the lab and we give them a, a camera attachment and the nephrologist can actually visualize the urine specimen, urine sediment. Uh, and of course, coordination of blood draw uh, if you're doing it at the patient's home. And then, frankly, some patients may not like being remote uh, from their physician, but our experience is that the vast majority of patients really think this is great. And in fact, I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of patients who've expressed any dissatisfaction at all in the past five years with telenephrology. Next slide. All right, we are on to our second polling question for the audience, and Matt, if you can go ahead and put that up. Um, the question is, what types of telemedicine technology is your organization using? So we'll give everybody just a, you know, a minute or so to get their answers in. They can pick more than one on that uh, question. There are several options. Or if they are not using any right at this time, they can also choose none. So Matt, you let me know when they're pretty much are slowing down. I sure will. And we see them. It's, it's still coming in at a good, brisk pace here. Uh, and as Stephanie noted, you can choose more than one. If you do choose option E, which is other, uh, please let us know in the chat what type of uh, technology you're using, uh, if it's not listed here. And we'll leave this open for about 15 seconds more or so. If, if, you, if you're making selections, multiple selections, and you haven't clicked that submit button yet, uh, we won't be able to record your answer until you do click submit. So we ask that you do that once you're done. Uh, All right. I think we will go ahead, Matt, and close that poll out so you can share with us the results. I sure will. We're going to go ahead and click that close button now. And just like last time, it's going to take us about 20 seconds or so uh, for WebEx to tally up the uh, the results here. And okay. uh, it's currently doing that. So. Uh, we do have a uh, diverse answers here, which we'll share in just about five seconds. <laughs> okay, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what's out there being used. Too. All right, and you should see them on your screen now. So it looks like, was there 127 responses? Um, two are using digital stethoscope, 34 video cameras. Nobody's using the long ultrasound device. Uh, one EKG device, uh, 10 other, and then 15 of them are none. So, okay, you're right, a very diverse um, use of uh, telemedicine out there. Well, thank you, everybody, and we'll go back to our speaker, Dr. Tannenbaum. Thank you. Next slide. 
So just as an example, here are some of the things that we uh, equip our patient homes with. Um, the uh, automated blood pressure cuff and the automated scale that you see in the picture are both Wi-Fi enabled. So when a patient uh, steps on the scale or takes a pressure, it automatically reports uh, their uh, results to a cloud, which we can see. And the cloud can be set up with notifications so that for problem patients, if we want to know, let's say a uh, patient uh, is getting hypotensive, hypertensive at home, uh, whether it's a dialysis day or non-dialysis day, uh, we can see that uh, as soon as they take their reading. What's also important about these particular devices, uh, and I'm not advertising them, there are others on the market, we just happen to use these, uh, is that these actually provide the patient with an audible reminder. So we can set up audible reminders for their scale and make sure that they do weigh, if we want them to weigh twice a day, morning and evening, uh, or even more, we can do that. Next slide. The electronic stethoscope I've talked about a little bit. Uh, what you see here is the latest version of what's called the eco stethoscope that we use. Um, again, it's uh, one of its, it, apart from the fact it's got excellent audio quality, uh, it works with an iPhone or an iPad. It works with any iOS device. And that really makes it very, very simple for us because we don't really need uh, a device on our end other than our iPhone or iPad and a good set of uh, just commercially available earphones. Uh, the other thing that this company has developed is on the right side, you see on the left side, a traditional stethoscope. On the right side, it's actually uh, a device that the patient can uh, hold in their own hand, uh, position up on their, uh, over their uh, chest, and we can actually hear uh, lung sounds and particularly heart sounds and get EKG waveforms uh, through that device remotely. And as you can see from the picture of the patient, it's a relatively simple training process. Next slide. Um, and actually, this company, when they compared, uh, they were they were looking. They they developed some artificial intelligence algorithms looking for things like atrial fibrillation. And interestingly enough, when they compared their AI uh, artificial intelligence algorithm uh, results to uh, uh, trained practitioners, some of whom were cardiologists, uh, they found that their uh, AI uh, interpretation was actually more sensitive and more specific uh, than uh, the human ear. Next slide. Now this device, the point of care lung ultrasound, in my view, is the real game changer. And I noticed on the responses, a couple of people are using an electronic stethoscope. No one is using a lung ultrasound. And um, for good reason, they are not real. I mean, they're readily available now, but that's only in the past six months to a year. This device is called a butterfly, and uh, it is truly a remarkable device. What you see is uh, on the left side of the picture is the butterfly probe. It's completely self-contained. And that wire that comes out the bottom of it goes into your iPhone or iPad. And you not only get to see the ultrasound uh, uh, picture on your own device, it simultaneously can be transmitted real time across the web to uh, someone who is a trained interpreter uh, who can give you a good interpretation of what you're seeing. Um, and uh, next, next slide. And what's amazing about the point of care ultrasound, the lung ultrasound, is how simple it is to perform and how much data, how much valuable information you get from it. What you see in the left-hand, uh, upper left-hand uh, slide picture is normal appearing lung. So you'll see that there are primarily horizontal lines going across the page. Uh, those are called A-lines, and uh, some of them represent actually the plural, uh, the plural line. Uh, these are just normal, uh, this is just normal lung tissue. There's no fluid in that lung. There's nothing for the sound waves to bounce off of and reflect back. Now, look at the right-hand picture, the upper right-hand picture, and what you can see is uh, what we call B-lines. And these, uh, they're otherwise sometimes referred to as rockets uh, or comet lines. These are highly indicative of fluid in the lung. And um, 
this, uh, when you compare this uh, ultrasound reading with uh, conventional chest X-ray or CT, it's extremely uh, been shown to be extremely accurate. In fact, uh, studies have shown it's much more accurate uh, than uh, auscultation. Um, so we actually use the point of care ultrasound to help us determine fluid status of the patient. Uh, we found, uh, and again, the literature certainly supports this, that uh, it's very difficult sometimes to interpret whether a patient is fluid overloaded based on auscultation. Sometimes you think they, uh, they have no rolls, they sound dry, but they're wet. Sometimes they sound really wet, but you get a chest X-ray and there's no visible fluid. Uh, the point of care ultrasound uh, really helps sort that out, and it's extremely easy to use. Uh, um, I mean, we can we've trained uh, staff to uh, use it in <laughs> in a very few minutes. Uh, now, it's not easy to learn how to use cardiac ultrasound. That takes a lot more sophistication. But a very simple point of care lung ultrasound is very simple. Next slide. As I said earlier, it's got excellent correlation with the chest X-ray. You can see here um, the uh, uh, on the left side you, you see a classic uh, set of uh, B lines, and on the right side you see uh, pulmonary congestion. Next slide. The other thing that uh, we found very helpful in our uh, remote monitoring, both in the hospital situation when we're monitoring inpatient acute dialysis with telemedicine, and in our home patients where we are, uh, where we may have patients who are, uh, you know, a little less stable than others, is the fact that we can gather real-time information through our electronic medical record. Uh, we coined it e-dialysis. And the e-dialysis uh, flow sheet data is available to us throughout the dialysis treatment. So if the nurse in the hospital or the tech or the home caregiver notifies us that there's a problem, and of course, we already know uh, vital signs that there might be a problem, but if they notify us, we can instantly from our mobile device look in and see exactly what the flow sheet data looks like, looks like as though it's, it's the same as though we were standing right in the room with the dialysis machine itself. Next slide. Finally, we've we've uh, been doing this, as I said, for about five years. And uh, go on to the next slide, please. And in our first uh, exposure to this in the inpatient setting was in 2015. And after about 16 months, we were able to gather data on uh, approximately uh, 2,000 uh, encounters which included about 600 uh, new consults and about 800 to 1,000 uh, supervised dialysis treatments. Um, it's a little difficult to read, but the, 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 the summary is that the, uh, uh, we were able to help a, a rural hospital, uh, a regional rural hospital, retain 93% of its patients who would, who would have otherwise been transferred uh, because, simply because they needed dialysis. Uh, and a renal consult to a tertiary facility. And we were able to help the hospital retain 97% of their patients who were admitted with ESRD. And all of those patients prior to our setting up telenephrology would have been transferred immediately because they didn't have dialysis services or real-time nephrology available. And the outcomes were uh, actually, uh, as you would expect, um, uh, approximately uh, uh, the patients with AKA, AKI had the same recovery um, as in the literature, um, but um, and the, uh, there were really no uh, no complications that we would have uh, that we saw in this setting versus any other. Next, um, again, we uh, have uh, seen the same thing. We repeated. Uh, you know, we, we updated our data, I should say not repeated, but we updated our data several years later. And uh, as you can see, uh, the vast majority of the patients uh, uh, were discharged to home. Uh, some were discharged to a SNF. Uh, there were very, very few uh, uh, deaths. Next slide. 
So in summary, uh, we've been in 28 hospitals. We've done uh, 4,361 initial consults, uh, 22,800 follow-up consults. Uh, we've supervised 2,728 uh, dialysis treatments. The average length of stay of our patients in those hospitals, including those who were not just ESRD, but in critical care was 6.22 days. 43% uh, of the patients were admitted with ESRD at the time of admission. 45% uh, 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 of patients who uh, uh, were admitted did not have ESRD, 12%, uh, um, but they had CKD, 12% had other renal issues, hyponatremia, and things of that nature. And as you can see, the mortality of our patients in the hospital, the ESRD mortality, was only 2.7%, and the uh, mortality from our AKI patients was 5.3%. Next slide. So in summary, and this is the last slide, uh, telemedicine is now readily available. Technology is affordable. It allows providers uh, in today's world to remain highly mobile while delivering uh, nephrology and other forms of telemedicine care. It's facilitated by the ubiquitous, ubiquitous availability of high-speed internet and electronic medical records. Uh, recent government actions have allowed uh, reimbursement uh, for telemedicine uh, regardless of the setting. Uh, patient satisfaction level is extremely high. Uh, it reduces as a collateral benefit, it reduces potential for spread of contagious disease. Clinical outcomes are equivalent to in-person uh, interaction, inter out, in, interaction outcomes. And finally, telenephrology and e-dialysis are tools that will allow highly trained dialysis nurses and nephrologists to serve more patients in more locations. Thank you very much for attending, and I look great, forward to the questions great. and comments. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tannenbaum. What a great presentation, and it's so nice to hear what you're doing with telemedicine. I think this is it's great, and obviously you started way before the COVID-19. Uh, You've already you're already ahead of the game, so that's great. Uh, there are some questions, so we'll get right to them uh, and get through as many as we can. So. This one's kind of two parts. So it says, in regard to the patient in the in center, how do you perform a telehealth visit on a patient who may need this while he or she is on the treatment in respect to their privacy and confidentiality of information be it exchanged? Or do you recommend this be done either prior to treatment or post treatment so it can be done in a private room? Well, that really depends on the patient and what their preference is. Uh, we, we do it both ways. Uh, I, might, I might say that um, in, in a typical dialysis center, um, unfortunately, there has historically been very little privacy. So even if you're making rounds in person and you're conversing with the patient, you have uh, a possibility that your voice is going to carry to the patient in the next chair. Uh, and vice versa, the patient's voice talking to you will do the same. Actually, what we found though is that we can supply the patient with earphones, and of course we're on the other end. So when we're talking, the patient really is the only one hearing us. So actually, the telemedicine affords more privacy in the setting of, a, of an in-center dialysis. But as I said, in-center dialysis is far from private, and we. Uh, encourage our patients to, uh, you know, if they have something to really say to us, uh, we, we're happy to see them, you know, in the uh, exam room. Great, great, but, thank you. I, I, I might just add one more thing that sure. because we're using telemedicine, we don't have to restrict our interview of the patient to when they're on dialysis. You know, most nephrologists visit the clinic on a schedule, our schedule, and, <laughs> you know, if the patient gets off dialysis, we're not there. Okay, then what? Here we can have the nurse, the charge nurse, put the patient in the uh, in the uh, exam room, and we can talk with the patient when they're either before or after dialysis. No problem. We are where we are. Great. Yes. Good. Great. Thank you. Um, here's a kind of a question. It says uh, power outages. Do facilities that rely this heavily on tele on, on technology have backup plans? What do those look like? Oh, okay. Well, first of all, yeah, yeah well, of course, it's a good question. Yeah, first of all, in a hospital, uh, all the hospitals have emergency power. So that that's the good news uh, in hospitals. 
uh, in a patient's home or the clinic. Uh, some clinics have emergency power, others don't. Uh, but ironically, the telemedicine equipment all has battery, is all on battery. So um, the, the trick is that we, um, you know, we, we basically make sure that the staff keeps the iPad charged, uh, the electronic stethoscope charged. Uh, and frankly, it, it's, you know, a bit of a nuisance if it's not charged because then they have to connect it to the wall. But uh, in fact, even if, uh, if they've done that, uh, even if the power goes out, we still have the telemedicine. We may not have the dialysis uh, or the lights, but we have, uh, we have the telemedicine. Okay, great. Um, this a little comment and then kind of a question uh, from Janice. She says, these are all great devices. How does a patient go about getting the blood pressure kit, scales, and stethoscopes for home use? Okay, great. Well, we, we actually provide that to our patients. When we, when we take them on as a home dialysis patient, we equip their house with the scale and the blood pressure cuff, teach the patient and their family how to use it. Because from our perspective, you know, managing the patient is vital. And it's not just the dialysis days that we care about. We want to know what's going on on their non-dialysis day as well. So we, uh, we basically provide that equipment. And then if the patient comes off home dialysis, it's our equipment, we take it back. It's no different than the machines. Okay, great. Good. That was one. Of, that was kind of my question as you went through this too. So that's good. Thank you for answering that. Um, another question: uh, What concerns have you identified in reimbursement when using telemedicine? Okay. Well, that is a complicated answer. Okay. Uh, right now, Medicare is, as I said, they're freely paying uh, for virtually any venue. Uh, in the past, the biggest challenge really has been. Uh, crossing state lines. So in, in, if you are doing telemedicine, for example, we're, many of our nephrologists are based in Tennessee, but some are actually based in New Jersey, California. Uh, but we serve hospitals all over the country. Uh, we have to get licensed as nephrologists, as physicians in those states, and then we apply to the hospital, we get admitted to their staff. But then when it comes time to bill, uh, let's say Medicare, um, there's a lot of confusion at the intermediary level. Uh, we send the claim in and sometimes it'll get bounced out because the intermediary doesn't recognize the patient may live in California, but the provider is based in Tennessee. They send the claim in to their normal carrier in Tennessee, which is what CMS guidelines suggest, not suggest, tell us to do. But the computer at the Tennessee uh, administ Medicare administrator's uh, office doesn't recognize a California address for the patient, and so they end up rejecting the claim. So uh, those are the, now if the patient is in Tennessee, there's no problem. It's a Tennessee physician sending it to a Tennessee claims processor, and it's a Tennessee patient, it's really pretty easy. But the challenge really becomes when it's across state lines. And, you know, we have to, each, each situation is a little bit different. So, you know, it's, that, that needs to be ironed out with the, uh, with CMS. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, let's see if we have, maybe, yeah, probably have time for one more, maybe two. Um, a question says, we have a number of transplant programs that are using telehealth to begin their initial evaluation process with similar excellent results. Do you see a role for the, that use of telemedicine kind of continuing? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, the transplant patients are uh, you know, and I failed, I really failed to mention that. I mean, the transplant patients are ideal uh, candidates for this because particularly many of them uh, get their transplants, you know, at a major center. And then they, particularly if they live in rural communities or even other urban cities uh, and they've come to this center, uh, you can perform your entire, you know, transplant, uh, both your pre-transplant evaluation and transplant follow-up with this. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, excellent place. Uh, okay, we have uh, one more question. Well, we have another question. Um, is the handheld devices, I think talking about some of the ultrasound and lung type things, uh, compatible with pacemakers or other implantable uh, devices? Yes. Yeah, the, the ultrasound is not a problem, neither is the uh, eco stethoscope. They are compatible. Great. Okay, good. Um, 
And um, another question, I know you I was earlier in the presentation, you talked about utilization of telemedicine telemedicine in rural areas, and the question is, what is the percent, do you feel, for Sanderling, of pa patient population in the rural areas that are utilizing telehealth right now? Okay, well, I mean, we're, you know, as a company, we're in 24, 28 hospitals, so we're in, we're in, uh, we're in locations every, everywhere from Hilo, Hawaii, to little towns in Georgia. Um, and but it's interesting. Uh, most of the patients in those communities are relying on telenephrology when they get sick. They go into their hospital locally. Um, some are still not, uh, you know. And it's, you know, I think it's uh, just not all patients are honestly comfortable getting care from a place where they've not received care before, and they they uh, they like going to their normal uh, place if it's a hospital in town and so forth. Um, but I'd say that the, you know, it's hard to put a percentage on. I, to answer your question, I really can't put a percentage on it other than to say sure. that the longer we've been in each community, the more adoption we've seen. Okay, great. Well, I, I think we're getting near the end of our presentation. I do want to remind everybody that these <clears throat> The slide deck and the recording will be posted to our the NCC website probably within three or four days. Um, it will also be sent to the networks and shared out to all the facilities. So all this information that Dr. Tannenbaum went over today, you will be getting uh, copies of. Um, and Matt, if you can go to the next slide. I just want to do a little uh, recognition of our the kidneyhub.org. It is uh, introducing <clears throat> this new uh, secure, mobile-friendly web tool for patients and professionals. It's developed by the ESRD NCC, NCC with assistance from patient subject matter experts. And there's a lots of good information, lots of links on that website about COVID, about infection prevention, transplant, home dialysis, uh, new ESRD patient education. Um, we also wanted to say that there's new features on there that includes the patient grant library, uh, understanding high KDPI and increased kidney risks videos and more. So just uh, please, when you have time, go visit the kidneyhub.org. Uh, next slide. And as a reminder, our next COVID-19 webinar events, we have one on September 8th. It's for the patient-focused event, but everybody is welcome. It's at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Our next professional COVID-19 webinar will be September 16th at 3 p.m. It is, we'll be talking about living in a multi-generational home during COVID-19. Um, I also want to remind everybody that if you are on the line, you want CE used, please uh, wait, and at the conclusion of this, as we close out, there will be a pop-up for a post-event survey. Once you have completed that and submitted it, you will be taken to our uh, Kidney Learning Center, and you will be able to get CEUs for that uh, for the presentation today. Uh, and next slide. And um, just want to thank again everybody for taking time out of their day today. I know we're all very busy. I know you. Um, Next time out of your day, but we're really glad that you were here today and listened to Dr. Tannenbaum, Tannenbaum do a, a great presentation on telemedicine. So again, Dr. Tannenbaum, thank you very much for being here today, taking time out of your schedule also, and uh, we hope to see everybody on a, on a future COVID-19 webinar. Thank you and have a good uh, rest of your day.